that if you didn't take, um, I want to make sure that you do walk off with it, um, which is the, the principles of governance and leadership. So if you don't have that, I'll pull those out. Okay, well I want to welcome, I want, first of all I want to thank Amanda for inviting um, me to join um, Susan here. Um, my name is Sandra Miller. Um, I'm just going to give you a little brief background of how I came to be what I am. I am currently what's called a circuit rider for the Campaign for Fair Education Funding. We are a large coalition of over 40 to 50 organizations that are working on trying to have fair education funding, We're mostly focusing on basic education funding. Um, we are working with a wide variety of organizations. Um, the five major organizations that take care of me are the business officials and superintendents. We've added the principals now. We work with Small and Rural School Association, and we're working with the PSBA, which is the School Boards Association. Um, just to give you a little background about what I am, I'm also a, entering my 11th year as a school director. I have been involved with the school board at Saucon Valley School District for a very long time. Um, I started that as a parent and, uh, in New Jersey. Um, you might not be familiar with New Jersey. Every year you have to pass your budget by a referendum, and you vote on it. And I had children that were in preschool, and the budget didn't pass. And it didn't pass the next year. And we had a brand new wing of school, so my son entered kindergarten, and I had to walk by two of totally filled with desks and chairs and all the equipment and no children. I had to do that for a whole year. And I decided that's crazy, that we built a building and we can't staff it. So I got involved with education funding in New Jersey to try to convince people to pass the budget that year so that we could hire back the teachers that were, you know, would fill these rooms and the kids could go back into it. Well, I did that for the year and then I moved. <laughs> so I, my child would have been in a class size of 16 um, for first grade, and we moved, and um, I moved to my school district, and I was told, come on in, that we'd have 27 kids in our school, in his classroom. And, um, and I thought, geez, I have to start this all over again. So I got involved with it as a parent, and, um, and then you complain so much uh, that sooner or later, uh, people on the school board um, said, you know, you really should be part of the problem. Come and sit on the board. Um, someone joked about that enemies closer kind of mentality. So I was on the school board, and I'm now starting my 11th year. Um, for many years, I was only one of two parents actually on our school board. Um, I'm not sure how familiar you are with school boards, but school boards in general are predominantly um, older males, um, often not parents. The, the, the age of, of what happens, many of them, um, you know, you, the average age is closer into the 50s than it is into the 30s. And that's, when you think about it, that makes sense. You know, you're very busy when you have small children, you have uh, demands of working and, and taking care of things. Um, at the same time, you also have a lot of professionals that want to give back. And uh, the largest profession of uh, school board directors are retired. That's what they, that's their profession, they're listed as retired. So there's a real, um, you know, interesting dynamic that occurs. So you have the parents that are coming into your meetings, um, and usually the first time a parent comes to a meeting is because they have a problem, and they have an issue, and then they start to pay attention to what goes on in their school district, and then you have to find a way to all work together and make it a success. Do you want to talk, or should I just keep going? You can keep going. That'd be great. So there is something that, um, as a school board director, I've really learned to feel strongly about. Uh, PSBA has the principles of governance and leadership. And it gives you uh, some guidelines on how we can behave. It gives you ideas to work under under the best of times and try to strive for under difficult times. And I wanted parents to understand that there's a lot of restraints on a school board. And there's a lot of issues that a school board has to handle that has nothing to do with whether or not the football coach has to be replaced or um, even taxes. <laughs> we know we have a lot of requirements that are federally mandated and state mandates. So I wanted to make sure that you saw these principles because it's important for people to, to understand what we have as our guiding ideas. Obviously, I consider the advocacy role one of the most important roles of a school board member, and I think it's also one of the most important roles of a parent. I think the parents and the community members need to make sure that their views 
are articulated well at a meeting, and that a school board member is able to take what those views are and make sure it fits into the role of a school director. Lead responsibly. I'm not going to read it because it's on this form for you. But it's important that you work as a team of 10. Um, that's what you're going to hear often, and, and as parents, you'll hear us call that. And the team of 10 are the nine board members plus the superintendent. The school board director is gearing towards the policy. It's the big picture. They're not involved in the day-to-day -day operations of the organization. They set a policy. They give them guidelines on what they want to see. They want to ensure compliance with what has to take place. And then the responsibility is of making sure that that occurs is at the administrative level. And that's a really hard dynamic. I have, I have a parent that came to me last night, because I had my school board meeting last night, and she comes up to me and starts talking about an issue that was about a specific child that was in a classroom and how this child behaves and what are you going to do about it. My child isn't safe in the building. And of course, you know, the first thing I say is, well, you know, did you talk to your administration? Did you talk to, the, did you follow your chain of, of command? School board directors are not in the position to intercede at that level. They, they can recognize the situation, they'll give you um, direction to who to contact and how to proceed, but it's, a, it's not something that we're supposed to be trying to address for you. It's supposed to be something that you're supposed to really work through the system, and then when it becomes a really large issue, and hopefully that won't happen, hopefully they'll, things can be addressed, then the school board will step in, but not on the individual student basis. We had, you know, this woman literally was told to sit down. They said she brought it up at the actual meeting and wanted to talk about it. And we can't have those types of, of situations and discussions because it's privacy issues. We can't talk about behavior of a student. Even if the name isn't mentioned, we're all in a small town. We, you all know who the kid is that got in the fight in the cafeteria. Everybody knows that. And if we talk about it publicly, that's a violation of privacy. So you have to be aware that the board isn't trying not to answer your questions. The board isn't trying not to be receptive to your complaints. But there's some you know, real restrictions on the kind of conversation we can have publicly. And that's why you're going to always hear, well, you should, always hear from your school director. Did you follow the chain of command? Did you tell the principal? Did you talk to the, you know, the administration? And have them use that system. It's really important. And it keeps you, at least as a school director and as a parent, um, not necessarily being on the role of having to make those decisions and be combative, because that's not the kind of relationship you want with the people that are, you're going to be supporting. I also want to go through the last parts pretty you know, quickly, but the planning and evaluating is important. It's important that we plan. That's our job is to plan, and then the execution is what happens at the administrative level. We have to make sure that we look at what's going on and we evaluate, but we're not the ones that's going to make sure that it actually occurs. And the last but not least, you know, I try to talk about acting ethically. Um, honestly, you know, we all, uh, it, it, when you start as a board member or you start as a parent, you feel real passionate about your issue. Or if you start as a community member and you're really concerned about the taxes that are occurring, you care really passionately about that topic. And then if you end up trying to go to board members and you try to become a board member or if you try to just become an active participant in your meetings, you have to make sure that you start looking at a big picture. And in your one you know, single agenda item or your one driving passion to be on the school board isn't the only reason that you're there. And then the only, you know, I have a parent who wants to run for school board right now. And she only came because uh, her child um, is upset about the gifted program. And I said, you know, so she's been sitting at meetings. She never attended a meeting before until a meeting that she came and told me she wanted us to fire the superintendent. And I was like, you know, geez, you know, we, we, let's, let's start small. <laughs> let's find out what you, what, why you're upset, how this works, and, and you know, and, and our superintendent was new, and she made change. You know, we don't make change ever in a small school district because you always have the same thing all the time. And so you, you know, you, you she, we dialed her back, and she's been coming to the meetings, and she now understands that you know you can't just have what your your one issue drive the force of you know, her activities and how she how the board's going to function and it's not the only thing that we're going to care about this semester all semester long we're going to be meeting monthly on gifted but we surely aren't going to be talking in at every board meeting she's like well you didn't talk about it today at the meeting last night and i said it wasn't on the agenda and we haven't had the meeting it was canceled because of the snow you know when there's something to talk about and there's progress then we do it but you have to look there's a lot of other things we have budget to deal with. We have other things to deal with. It's not always one issue. Thank you.
working with the board. I say this to everybody all the time. We're not, as a parent, as a community advocate, you're not really there to make um, enemies. You're there to make change. So you have to be you know, somewhat respectful of how you speak at a board meeting. You have to make sure that as board members, you're respectful to the individuals that are in your audience. People forget, and I actually had a parent mention this last night, we are looking at going to all-day kindergarten. Um, as I said, there aren't a lot of uh, parents that are necessarily on my school board. Um, we don't have, we have a real mix of individuals that have different goals and agendas on our school board. And some of them aren't sure that all-day kindergarten is the way to go. Then we will not have to add um, any teachers. We will not have to add any school rooms. And we will be able to go to all-day kindergarten. So it's basically neutral, except we might have to add a school bus, because we currently don't transport in the middle of the day when the, for half-day kindergarten. A lot of school districts do because they're big, but we're small enough that parents have to pick up and shuttle the kids around. And a parent said, you know, who's going to make the decision about all-day kindergarten? And pointed out all the nine of us, and she said, is the superintendent? Or, and the, the solicitor reminded her that that's a policy. That's a change in the curriculum. That's something that, that we'll vote on. So you have to remember that I wouldn't come into a meeting and offend the people that you need to have on your side. I wouldn't come into a meeting and accuse people that are going to be working with you um, that they're working against you. That's not the way to develop the relationship. I also always include people to do the last part thing. Better be part of a solution, so if you have a complaint, can you make a recommendation how the best way to go? Only way that people are going to listen to you. If you only stand up there and say, I don't like this, I don't like that, I, but I did the research, I looked into this, all day kindergarten provides these benefits, and that's what some of the parents did last night. And so it gave a, a more knowledgeable kind of discussion, and it showed how they understood how we handle change. We are slow. We had a presentation, and then we'll have another presentation in two weeks. And then we'll have a, then it may be, it might be on the budget discussion. Because it doesn't really gonna cost us any money. You know, there, so it really doesn't necessarily have to be part of the budget discussion. But if we decide that we're gonna go ahead and add a bus, it might be something. You, you might wanna know, my school district has not raised taxes in eight years. It's insane. No one else in the whole Commonwealth has been able to do that. We haven't had, we have very little business. So when the business economy and all the properties for commercial lost value and there was new assessments and all of this happened, school districts lost a great deal of money. They also lost a great deal of money when houses are bought and sold. And our market stayed pretty stable, so we didn't lose a great deal of money. We're probably only 3 or 4% down even in our house sales. So we were very unique. So to be able to put a proposal forward that doesn't cost us any money, you would think they'd be jumping up and down. But they know the culture, and they know that's how we handle change. They have to slowly introduce ideas and do it. Now, if you have a real innovative board, I'm not sure. I know you have some individuals that are new. I know you have some individuals that are experienced and understand how the school system works. You might be able to have a presentation the next month. You might be able to vote on it. The next month, you're allocating the resources, and you're going ahead and adding a new fine arts program or you know, adding a new sport. I don't know if you guys play lacrosse. That was probably the fastest decision that was ever made at our school board. And it was the oddest decision, because it was going to cost $60,000. And they approved it, and it was, it was remarkable, I have to tell you. I still, to this day, am odd. It was presented, and the next month they approved it. And then important things, you know, will take us a year. We had to have four task force committees set up to decide whether or not we're going to take, make a change to gift it. So it's all, you know, interactive, and it all depends on how it goes. I'm going to be finishing, so you guys can ask questions at the end. The next slide, please. But I wanted to give you some resources. That's important to know. If you're a new school board member, I believe that you have seen the guide for new school board members. That's important. But you should also, as community members, I always tell this to parents, they should have a look at what the, the Pennsylvania School Board Association's website is. There's a lot of material and resources, and it gives you an idea, and that's the PSBA.org. You know, it gives you, idea, it gives you ideas on how to handle problems. They have all the legislative and advocacy, uh, advocacy information, and it gives you a real good feel for what your school board's hearing, what they're learning, and what they have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. I also recommend that you, you're going to hear this, and I don't ever want you to read it the school code, 
but it's something that really drives us. So if someone says just because of school code, we can't do that. Or because of ERISA or FERPA, all the acronyms are, are, are part of the thing. These, the new member guide and the school code will give you some idea what they're talking about. It's very, very, very strict on how much you can say, what you can say, and what you can decide in a private exec session and also at a, a public meeting. The Sunshine Act, that's important for you to understand how, the, how that works. Um, the documents that are out there, we know, our, I don't know how your school um, board handles their, their agendas. We put our agendas out on our website. Our meetings are on Tuesday. They're often out by Friday on the website, so people know what we're going to talk about. Each school has their own plan. Some do it just the day of the meeting. Um, that <coughs> has to be a balancing act because the a lot of the, the material is not necessarily decided on until maybe the day before a meeting. An issue might come up and something has to be put on your agenda. And the last thing I want to, uh, the PTOs in the area um, have some really good advocacy and some good guidelines on how to handle making change at a school, and how to deal with parents and how to deal with your school board and your administration. So it's important to do that. Next. I'm finished. Thank you. I hope I gave you a little, I didn't, I, we were unsure of who the, the population was going to be. I knew it was going to be a mix of parents and some new board members. And uh, I just wanted to be available. I normally do the, the talk on the campaign and money, but Susan's <coughs> going to get to talk a little bit about advocacy and money tonight. So. Great. Thank you, Sandra. Thanks. So I met Sandra, I work with Education Motors of Pennsylvania, and five years ago, it was almost five years ago to this date, I was a very happy stay-at-home mom. I had a first grader and a third grader. I had been a teacher, we moved to Pennsylvania, I decided to stay home with my daughters. And life was grand until February of 2011 when Governor Corbett said, well, we're going to be cutting $1.2 billion from public school funding. And a group of parents in our, in our town got together and we said, that sounds horrendous. That's going to be terrible. That's going to impact our schools. And so we made four of us made homemade t-shirts that said, education, you got what you pay for, put a big apple on it. We marched into our school board meeting. We said to our school board members, you can't cut anything from our kids' schools. And they looked at us like, do you have absolutely no idea how this works? You know, we get most of our money from the state. So if the state cuts funding, then we have to deal with that. Like, we're going to have to take what we get from the state and then make decisions based on that. And then we said, well, who makes these decisions? And then they said, well, it's your state lawmakers who make these decisions. And so at that point, we really learned who our state lawmakers were. And we um, said, there's nobody, no one's paying attention to this. And that was really something that was bothering us. So we said, what would we do if we were parents and we were going to have to raise all this money? But we would have a bake sale, right? Because that's what parents do. They raise money through bake sales. So we went to Harrisburg. And we baked piles of cookies and made homemade signs and we had a, a little rally and we said we'd have to sell 2.4 billion cookies in Pennsylvania to make up for the 1.2 billion dollars in cuts. And we had, it was a very successful event, we got a lot of press for it, and that's why I met Education Voters, I met a representative of Education Voters who um, was there to, to see who we were as parents and to talk to us about advocacy, to say if you are a parent and you are informed, you can have a very powerful voice in helping to affect change and helping to do things to make your schools as good as they can be. And so we got in touch with education voters and five years ago they came down to Shippensburg. I'm from Shippensburg, Pennsylvania, which is down um, Cumberland and Franklin counties. We just got 30 inches of snow um, and so we're dug out. But they came down to Shippensburg and did a presentation that was kind of like this. And then we formed a parent group and we started meeting with lawmakers and we really moved things forward and started helping our community kind of lift this issue up. Um, and so over the years I got to know them and then I started working for them as an advocacy coordinator. So I go around and talk to people and I'm so excited to be up here because I've never been up here before and it's really pretty and very nice up here. So if you could go to the next slide, we'll probably go through these pretty quickly. So you can go to the next one. Um, can you go to the next one? So we are a nonprofit, nonpartisan group, and then we also have an arm that does election stuff that's separate from our nonpartisan nonprofit. So we do, in election times, endorse candidates, both Republicans and Democrats, who support public education in Harrisburg. Uh, next slide. So the question a lot of people that we that I came to understand five years ago is like, why does state policy matter to us on the local level? 
Well, in Western Wayne, 34% of your funding from, comes from the state, 62% is local, and 2% is federal. Obviously, those numbers are a little off because they don't add up. They were probably rounded down. But a lot of the funding that you get comes from the state. And so um, when state funding changes, it impacts you on the local level. Now, 20 years ago, the state share of funding was about 50%, close to 50%. And so local communities didn't have to bear such a heavy load when it came to raising the money to pay for your local school district. Over the past 20 years, it's really <coughs> declined in Pennsylvania, and, and that puts a lot of pressure on property taxes. And that's a pretty tough thing in a lot of communities where the property tax base just isn't there. So you're, you're constantly asking people for more money to support great schools. Um, and so that's why the state funding matters right now. Um, yeah. um, so we have, um, I just wanted to give you a little update on the state budget in case, it's, in case you don't know it, you probably do. So the state budget is supposed to be passed at the end of June. We still do not have a state budget. Um, the, right before Christmas, the legislature passed a budget that increased school funding by 1.8%. Now, a 1.8% increase in school funding is an increase, but it is not an increase that is going to allow school districts to even pay their mandated expenses. A 1.8% increase in state funding moves Pennsylvania schools backward. It puts more pressure on property taxes, and it means that local school districts are going to have to make more cuts. That's just that's just the reality. It doesn't keep up with inflation, and it doesn't keep up with the cyber charter costs or the pension increases that school boards have to, that school districts have to pay. Um, so Governor Wolf, he line item the budget, line item vetoed the budget, sent about half the money out to school districts so that school districts at least had money flowing into them because there were a lot of school districts that had had to take out loans. But he said we're not done with this budget. Uh, he's fighting to get a higher increase in education funding so that schools can start to move forward and, and not have to continue to rely on local taxpayers. Um, and advocacy has made a real difference. Throughout the state, people have talked to their lawmakers and they have said, look, we cannot have a fifth year of state budgets that continually inadequately fund our schools because we just can't handle it on the local level with taxes or with making cuts in our schools. Um, so, we are part of the Campaign for Fair Education Funding, which is school district organizations, but it's also, we have religious organizations, um, we have child advocacy organizations, charter school organizations are part of it. It's, it's a broad coalition. And we've come together and we've said that what we really need to start moving Pennsylvania forward with education funding is $350 million in new basic education funding and $50 million in special education funding. The special education funding um, has been basically flat in Pennsylvania for six to eight years, and um, the costs keep rising. So again, you know, local local taxpayers are picking up that difference. And then the, the very exciting thing that happened that was this bipartisan thing was that a group of lawmakers came together and they said, you know, the way that it's not even how much money we give out that we, we give to school districts, it's how we allocate it because the the state does not allocate money right now based on how many students are in schools or what it costs to educate them or how much local tax effort communities make. The state allocates money to school districts based on the number of students that were in the school districts in 1991.